Let us pray. Now, O Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for yourself. Lord Jesus, amen. amen. Please be seated. When Father Mike asked me to give this talk, I guess it was two or three months ago, I didn't hesitate to say yes because um, giving these talks is a real important part of my personal ministry. Whether it be here today or at morning prayer or when I do weekends at Graymore, it's something that I really enjoy doing. And my wife Debbie, who is actually traveling and not here today, critiques all my talks before I give them. So because I'm compulsive, I finished this like two and a half months ago. <laughs> and Debbie read it and called me in the living room and she said, it's very nice. And I was waiting for the but. And she said, but did you read the gospel for November 3rd? And I said, yes, I did. And she said, there's a really important message you need to talk about in that gospel. So I suggest to you that you rewrite your talk and somewhere in the middle, if you want to talk about your personal journey, it's okay. So I always listen to what my wife tells me to do. So I reread it, rewrote it, she reread it. We agreed it was the right thing to do. So I hope that we all get a little bit out of it today. So just looking, thank you, is a phrase that we probably all at least use once in our life, if not heard before. When a salesperson in a store approaches us to see if they can be of assistance, we may say these words to keep them at a safe distance. We're interested, but not willing to commit. Curious, but don't want someone pressuring us into making a purchase. Zacchaeus was curious that day that Jesus came to Jericho. The crowd was big and he was small. So he shimmied up a sycamore tree, which he thought was the perfect solution. He was high above the noisy crowd and he could get a glimpse of Jesus from a safe distance. Besides, let's admit it, he didn't have any friends in the crowd. Zacchaeus was the chief collector for the Roman government in this very prosperous town, and his position may have made him the most headed man in all of Jericho. He worked for the occupying forces, and therefore was a traitor to his own people. What's more, he made money off his neighbors, and as part of a prime corrupt system, he was only obliged to give the Romans what they expected. Anything else he took in above that, he was free to keep. He was wealthy, as our text reads, in this case an indictment rather than a description. So who would make room for him in a crowd? Who would want to be seen with him? One day along comes Jesus. The word is spread about Jesus, and Zacchaeus is one of many in the crowd who want to see him. But what does Zacchaeus expect to see? What would he like or see in Jesus? On the other hand, maybe he has heard that Jack, Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was known for eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. Maybe he has heard that in some of Jesus' stories, it's the tax collector who is the hero and the Pharisee who comes across as the fool. Maybe he has heard that a man named Levi, who is a tax collector, is among Jesus' closest followers. On the other hand, maybe Zacchaeus has heard that Jesus told the rich man, to sell everything he had to follow him. Or maybe he heard Jesus' statement that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. After all, Levi had le left his tax collector's booth behind in order to follow Jesus. So maybe the most we can say with confidence about Zacchaeus is that he was curious. He wants to see Jesus, but he doesn't want to meet him. He doesn't want to touch him, or be touched by him. He certainly doesn't want to come to him for a healing. He wants to observe from a safe distance. Zacchaeus thinks he is safe up in a tree where he can watch, where no one will confuse him with the cheering crowd, where no one, will, where no one needs to know where he stands, where he can't be touched or touch, where he is safe to say, just looking, thank you, if anyone accidentally spies on him up there, just looking. And suddenly this strange little man in a tree seems a little more familiar. Don't we all have our times in our lives where it's easier to just stay in our tree, to watch events unfold in the world as a spectator, rather than come down and getting involved? 
rather than come down amongst the crowd and the dirt and the noise and the needs and the confusion and put one foot in front of another and follow Jesus. Isn't it easier sometimes to say, just looking, thank you, when asked to help, to give, or to get involved? There's a different sermon for those among us who try and do everything, who need to learn to say no, who need to work on some Sabbath time. But for others of us, it's time to get involved and stop being a spectator and to join the action. Maybe it's time to take on some ministry in the church, to get involved in the community. Maybe it's time to vote, to say yes, to serve. Sometimes getting involved in a church takes a deep leap of faith. Church shopping is not a bad thing. Many of us have shopped our way into the Episcopal Church, or in particular, this parish church. In this case, we have all shopped ourselves into St. Luke's. It's important for people, for us to look around, to explore different faith communities, to find a place where they can worship, to grow, participate, serve, be at home, and yet be challenged too. For me, my journey has been long and difficult. On January 30th of 1995, after 25 years of gambling, I put a gun to my head because I thought that was the only way out. But God had plans for me. On March 1st of that year, I made my last bet. And on March 7th of 1995, I made my first Gambles Anonymous meeting. So I stand up here now, hadn't gambled for 25 years, and now not gambled for 25 years. On May 30th of 1995, I met Debbie. And Adam was seven. Debbie was a Christian woman who went to church. I was not a Christian man and hadn't been to church in over 25 years. But we started dating. And Debbie said to me one day, do you want to go to church with me? You know, interesting concept. So um, I said, sure. And her church at the time was St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in Ardsley. And the pastor there was Father Robert Godley. Amazing. So I went to church, and I was very apprehensive on that first Sunday. And the weirdest thing is that the people who had no idea who I was were all nice to me. So over the next couple of weeks, I continued going, and then the church picnic came upon us, and I did what I normally do, was grill. It was a great time for all. Over the next few weeks and months, I was voted onto the vestry. I was on the altar as a Eucharistic minister, building, buildings and grounds, coffee hour, and midnight runs to Manhattan, which were very humbling. And things were great. In 1997, Debbie and I moved to Yorktown. We were living in separate homes because we were not married yet. In the fall of 1998, Debbie said, I need to speak to you. And I said, what's up? And she said, um, sorry. She said, I can't be with you anymore. And I said, why? And she said, I asked you to go on a number of Christian weekends and we're on totally spiritual levels. So I need to move on. And I said, but look what I've done over the last two years. And she said, what have you done? You're just going through the motions. So I left. And for the next week, I remember going to work and being like a zombie. And I would drive by her house and look at the cats in the yard and uh, say to myself, I'm probably never gonna see him again. And uh, trying to get a glimpse of Adam off the school bus and driving by where she worked to look at her car and maybe catch a glimpse of her. And as, as, as a couple of weeks went by and then I ran into a good friend of ours, her name is Jean, a wonderful Christian woman. Jean knew Debbie before I did and Jean is still a big part of our lives today. And Jean said to me, and she is so exuberant, she goes, I know where Debbie's gonna be on Sunday afternoon. And I'm like, okay. And she says to me, you need to go to our church. She's setting up for our church bazaar and you need to be there and talk to her. I'm like, why? And Jean said, because God has plans for you. So I went there that Sunday. We talked for literally two minutes. But we decided that we'd meet in my house the following Wednesday. So Debbie came over and we sat on my green leather couch and we talked for three hours. And I cried for three hours. And the last thing I said to her was, is this what you want? 
for a relationship to end. And it seemed like an eternity before she answered me, and she said, no, but you need to change. And you need to make a Christian weekend, not for me, but for you. So the following year, March of 99, I went on a Christian men's weekend, a three-day retreat. And that weekend changed my life. On that weekend, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so our journey began together. Our walk in faith together, our walk with Christ together began. So fast forwarding to March of 2000, uh, the fall of 2000, we're having dinner and Debbie says to me, I need to talk to you. And I said to myself, (laughs) what did I do now? And she said to me, there's something that happened two years ago on your couch that I couldn't tell you then because you wouldn't understand. But I can tell you now. She said, I had no intention of staying with you. I was just going through the motions that three hours that we spent together. And when you asked me that question, do you want this relationship to end? Is it over? I was going to say yes. But the Holy Spirit intervened and told me that I had plans for both of you. So on December 7th of 2002, we got married at St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in Ardsley in front of our family and friends. And 17 years later, we're still worshiping, praising, and walking the walk together. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a quarter of three strands is not quickly broken. You see, I finally came out of my tree. But there can be a danger sometimes that people don't ever come down out of their tree. And they say, this is it. Here I am. I'm getting involved. Or in our faith lives, wanting to see Jesus is a good thing, but keeping him at an arm's distance. Do we ponder him from a distance rather than meet him, come to know him, to love him, to serve him, to be changed by him, rather than grow more and more into his image and likeness? rather than discover the meaning of lives through a deep relationship with him, empowered by prayer, nurtured by participation in the faith community, nourished by the sacraments. That day in Jericho, Jesus looks up in the tree, and he sees this little man clinging to his branch, and he commands him to hurry down. Why? Because Jesus needs him. He needs his hospitality. He needs his welcome. He needs his company. So Jesus plucks Zacchaeus out of the tree, and Zacchaeus is happy to come down and welcome him. It would have been so much easier for Zacchaeus to say no, because he would have cost him so much less. It would have attracted less attention. It would have prevented the townspeople from having one more reason to grumble about something that Zacchaeus did. We know it may be easier to go on with our own lives and continue our own preoccupations with ourselves and our own agendas rather than allow the Messiah to invite himself over to lunch and to allow him to delve into our truest selves. It might be easier to say, just looking, thank you. But if we're honest, we know from experience that it's not easier to go on with our own preoccupations, to try and take care of our worries ourselves, that, it's actually, that actually there is a tremendous ease and grace into letting Jesus take our burdens from us, to giving ourselves over to Christ. Let Christ set our agendas. It really is easy to stop scrambling up trees and allow ourselves to know the one who knows us completely and loves us still. Like Zacchaeus, we can take the chance, invite Jesus in, and watch the radical realigning of our lives. Because Zacchaeus' life changed greatly. Something in his encounter changed the way Zacchaeus saw the world. Now he could see people in need, whereas before he only saw people he could use. That's part of what happens when we come out of our tree and allow Jesus to touch us. Whereas before we might just be looking, Jesus enables us to really see. Now we see real people with real needs. We see real opportunities to get involved. We see true beauty in others. We see the astonishing array of gifts God has given us in our community. Salvation comes to Zacchaeus' house and he is forever changed from a taker into a giver. And Zacchaeus is not unique. We see it over and over again. When Jesus finds a home with us, the result is a generous heart. 
Giving is not a burden. Giving is not a joy. Giving is a joy, not a burden. What's given may be money, may be time, may be some ability that can be shared. But time and time again, when Jesus plucks us out of our tree, we ripen into givers, not takers, workers, not watchers, people who serve, not observe. Jesus isn't just coming to our town. He is already here. And he may be looking up at you, inviting you out of some safe but lonely perch and into the kingdom of God. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty.